I just realized I'm a little bit, well, Kransky's on the camera then, but I don't know if you want him in the shot instead. I realized oh, I love Kransky. <laughs> not on the Zoom one, but um, I'll spin it like that so you can see him there. Yay! <laughs> so um, another one of the questions that I got, uh, I think this one came from my Instagram um, and someone asked what our thoughts are on GAMSAT and its predictive value uh, as to being a successful student and doctor versus other factors such as life experience. I mean, I feel like my answer is probably obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bag out ASA too much. <laughs> I think um, we enjoy it a little bit though. <laughs> yeah, maybe we just... No, I think, um, I think it's just a really interesting system, to be honest. Um, in terms of like problem solving, 100%, like you need potential medical students who are going to be book smart. Yeah, it's just an inherent part of it, I think. Yeah, 100%. Often a lot of the people that are book smart have great work ethics, um, have like, you know, are just very intelligent and have great problem solving skills. So it is in a sense a good predictive value of that because if you, to be able to score well in the game set, like you're not a robot, you know, you can't, you've got to be able to, yeah, to logically think through things, to communicate well, like there's a reason that there are three very different sections but I also think like there's a reason that there are interviews for medical schools yeah. as well and there's a reason that, like that's a whole process as well and you said like removing those was you know a factor of just COVID being a thing. I wouldn't be surprised if they bring them back. I did have someone and un another undergrad at UCID uh, spoke to me about it and they said that there was a seminar or something I think. Oh yeah uh, I actually ran, I ran that one. <laughs> oh really you ran yeah, that? Yeah yeah um, well, I'm an, I'm an SRC for the MedSci cohort um, and we organized the, a guy from UCID admissions coming in. It wasn't anything too surprising, but basically what he said was the key stuff. He went over like the degree, the course, so coursework, the plan in terms of the GAMSAT and med interviews. They said they got rid of them because of COVID and that they're not, and I quote, like bringing them back anytime in the near future. At yeah. least that's what their plans are. They weigh section one and section two or they have an algorithm that they basically put all of our GAMSAT scores into based on the formula that they've selected to weigh like rumors are that section one and section two are being weighted higher maybe you have yeah. some solid information about that as well and then they kind of like put literally put that into a system that's what it sounded like <laughs> pump out the numbers rank everybody and then that's that's how they pick their candidate. So they maybe use an algorithm because I know I did like uh, last week I did a video on the admissions process and I was really researching it for the first time in detail myself. And uh, I do know about the 1.25 thing, but I think that's like a mathematical correlation that people have found just with like the section scores that got offers this this time around. Yeah, um, I figured that's what it was. Yeah, like the admissions guide, I'm sure they're trying to be somewhat, you know, mystical about how they do things to keep people at bay, but. Uh, in the admissions guide, it sounded like they were just ranking, like you just get a rank score for each of the three. And then my thinking would be that it would be an like a lowest total, almost like a golf score, like the lower the rank, the lower the number, the, the higher up you are. And they just want to see an average across the three. Um, yeah. And I think it's just kind of worked out that the people who, it kind of makes sense. Like you need to be an all rounder in that case. Like it shows like, and you look at the scores that get in people, most people, have, are actually not relying on a particular score. They've kind of got like, obviously you need very high scores for UCID, but they're all kind of like pretty consistent across the board, which I guess is probably quite kind of rare in itself. And there's fewer people that are kind of getting in on one really strong score. Do you know what that is for UCID? Just out of my own interest. <laughs> yeah. So like, what are people saying? Is this all on Reddit? Like, yeah. So I looked on like Reddit is where like a lot of people were saying that the 1.25 thing was really popular. But then looking at the admissions guide from, from UCID, like it, it just says that each section score is ranked and then your ranking in the three sections will determine your overall ranking. And then overall ranking determines places and they just work through the pecking order. So like, yeah, my thinking is that they will just take everyone's section one scores, rank them all, and you'll get a number from one to however many. And the same for two and three. And then the, it, I guess it would make the most sense. There wouldn't be any reason why they wouldn't have to do anything else. But is just to add your rank score and get a total rank. And so the lowest total is the best student work their way down like that. And they're just doing different ranked lists for the different entry schemes, like for rural cohorts and for 
um, like if I think they have an Indigenous pathway and then for like international students and stuff. Yeah. And then they're adjusting the selection process based on like who's ticking CSP and BMP and that kind of stuff. I suppose this is all the stuff that they've had to implement in the absence of interviews as well. I'm sure many people would pay money to, to find out <laughs> what oh, yeah, they're actually doing. Um, but yeah, I saw your video on the admissions process. And mm. to be to be honest, like with your, your problem solving skills for section three, I would put my money on you. Work it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that it definitely has some predictive value. And I think the fact that GAMSAT is becoming a more popular entry test as well, the fact that more countries are picking it up that started here and then it's slowly grown in popularity and appears to continue to be growing in popularity. The fact that you've got unis like UCID sticking with GAMSAT and scrapping interviews, yes, for convenience and, and that kind of thing as well. But it shows the unis hold some value in the scores. So there's a there's an element of it that is just trying to cut the numbers down. It does a very good job of doing that. Yeah, I think like my experience with it is it feels like a, a test of stamina. I know a lot of people aren't really supportive of that theory that it's testing stamina and resilience, but I think it really is because they're probably like medical schools are probably very aware that the average is two to three sittings. So people who are willing to go again, despite having had a pretty tough time with it, that I think says a lot about a person. And as well as that, the fact that it is so long, it seems kind of crazy that you have to be put through such, it's, it seems like very old school, like medicine's all, already such an old school pathway. And then despite all of the advancements and the modernisms in it, they're still like, but you have to sit a five plus hour test under high stakes. That's, it just doesn't seem like it's evolved. But I think that's popular with them because people who are able to work under that kind of pressure it's probably, again, selecting qualities and people with experience dealing with that kind of pressure. Because in the reality, like, as a doctor, you're not always going to be working under that kind of pressure if you have to perform for hours on end and every little decision has a massive, massive impact. But yeah. there are going to be times where you have to deal with consistent pressure and not have that sway your ability to think critically. And I think that's what it all becomes is can you just maintain your composure when the environment is changing? Because I think that's, like, I don't know much. I, I can't say I, I know it. I don't know any doctors or anything like that. I've never shadowed anyone or anything. I would imagine that that environment requires people who can think clearly on their feet, despite a lot of things, a lot of chaos going on as well. Yeah. I had uh, another question as well from someone. Top two med school preferences and why? Mm. Well, I mean, I think everyone knows mine is you said for sure. Number one, there's no reason why I wouldn't put it number one. Um, I don't. I don't really think I've thought about a second. All that much. <laughs> no plan B. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like. I, I know that I'll be applying everywhere, but I've not really thought about it much. I'd probably say Deakin though. And uh, originally, I thought that I would put Deakin first because obviously, like Sydney, it's a different application, so I kind of can put Deakin first in terms of GEMSAS. But um, now that like I've got a good shot at UCID moving to Geelong would still kind of be equivalent to moving to Sydney in a sense. The only difference would be that I wouldn't necessarily be in driving distance of family and friends, but otherwise every other aspect of my life would change anyway, if I were to move out to Geelong. So I kind of treat them as comparable. And then I guess like you said, is still number one because it's, I like the idea that it's a bigger cohort and it it's, I'm not, this is nothing against Deakin because I really don't know much about medical school. I got to do my research on it, but I, I prefer a big cohort to a small cohort, weirdly. I know a lot of people like the small thing. Um, I much prefer big cohorts because again, like I know that I, I like chaos and I learned that with running a business. Like I absolutely love it. So I don't like when things are too slow paced or too controllable. And I feel like a small uni, as much as there's a lot of niceties about that, I don't think it fits my personality as much. Like I almost have like a short attention span for it where I feel like it would be, it sounds ridiculous to be saying like, but it feels like I'd be more at risk of getting bored with it compared to Sydney. Like it's closer into the, like it's right near the city and it's yeah, bigger cohort, more stuff going on. Um, and again, I don't know much about either uni, so I could be completely wrong here. That's just my initial impressions that, It'd yeah. probably be you sit and then Deacon for those reasons. Yeah. Yeah, right. Nice. I think, yeah. um, well, mine's obviously I'm pretty outspoken about 
me wanting to go to UCID now. Yeah. <laughs> UCID, I think the reason, main reasons are because like just like the quality of the education, like the, for me, like uni, Melbourne uni, SID, like there's something charming about the, the history of those unis. Hmm. I Like I've had a great experience at UCID here. After having also been to UTS, I definitely am more of a UC kind of person. Great education, great teachers, um, lovely campus. I want to play basketball for them as well. Oh, nice. Um, so there's a couple of things there, but I just mostly because it is it just like I really enjoy going there now. And I'm sure that their med program would, would even surpass expectations as well. Second choice, probably Notre Dame in Sydney as well. Just because... I was actually going to go there for undergrad. And I, I kind of, although it's like, I'm not religious myself, I don't think that the religious side of their university like plays too much into their education. I have a couple of friends that go there and it's more just about like they uh, have dedicated lessons to like studying theology or philosophy or you can take religious subjects if you want to. Um, but it's more just about like the, the approach and like the ethos of religion that I think they kind of imbue in their education which I, I really don't mind like I think that sounds nice um and in terms of like the smaller sizes I I kind of like I don't mind it like I, I don't mind being like cushioned here and there I I just hear great things about Notre Dame as well I think yeah. it is like kind of like up and coming as a great school not only in like medicine postgrad but in undergrad as well so right and that's, that's the nice thing about it too, is that it doesn't actually matter what medical school you go to because in a, yeah. we just, every medical school in Australia is great. So yeah, once you've so got lucky. the degree and the qualification, like I guess the only thing is like where you intern, like your opportunities for where you can do internships. Yeah. Like it kind of becomes that thing where it's like, well, you choose the uni that fits into your lifestyle best instead of like going for which one ranks best because the ranking doesn't, doesn't. I also just have the attitude of like, I'll take my shot anywhere. Like, yeah, I think everyone. I don't like, <laughs> mind. I think it wouldn't matter where something was preferenced. If I saw an offer come to me, I would just, without thinking, just like, yes, I'm taking that. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, send me up to Darwin. I don't know if they have any medical schools there, but like, yeah, I'll I can't take it. the name of it. There's one up in Northern Territory. I forgot there the name. is. Yeah, yeah. There's one up there. Well, I would sign me up. <laughs> We've got an interesting one. Um, here. So I think as well, uh, this one's from uh, Nathan, who I think you're also doing some uh, training with him as well. We're both working with Nathan. Yeah, he's a nice yeah. guy. Um, he's asked, what do you guys eat on the day of the exam and during the break? That sounds like it's coming from an exercise physiologist. <laughs> Not surprised to see you ask that question. <laughs> Good, great question. Honestly, I'm a big one for like, you know, food is fuel. What I ate, I think I had like genuine, just like carb loaded the night before. Like I was like, I had a big game the next day. Um, and then the morning wake up, like uh, mine was at 7am. So I didn't really have any time to go for a walk or go for a run or anything before. Um, although I would have loved to, like the day before I literally did nothing. I just like watched TV, lounged around, took, took a break. It was great. And then I think I had just like, standard cereal and stuff and then I took like I packed a coffee with me so I could have it halfway through just to like have a burst <laughs> through section three you gonna need it yeah yeah and then um yeah I think I just like try you know I tried to eat well I packed some chocolate as well like just pack pack probably more food than you think you're gonna need because I yeah. I'd rather have more food than not enough <laughs> oh yeah absolutely yeah I I found like I had a very, when I look back at it, it was such overkill, but it did work was um, so I started planning my food and during my timed practice tests, I would do them at 7am and time them all. And then I would also practice what I was eating to learn what felt good, like what changed my mood and my energy level in section three. And so I, uh, I did the same thing. Like I packed more than what I needed. So I had choice. Cause I remember that last time I sat it, I remember like, I just went and sat in my car because I don't like sitting in crowds in exam situations. It stresses me out. And I remember just not feeling hungry. Like I had food to eat and I was just like, I don't want to eat any of this because I'm too amped at the moment. So I had that in mind. So the morning I didn't eat much at all. I think I just ate, I ate like a muesli bar kind of thing. And then I did the same thing. Like I ate a lot of carbs the day before, didn't do any exercise. I took the day off work and just relaxed mostly, didn't study. And then in the break, uh, I had, because I'm also on a thing at the moment, I'm only drinking water. So I've been doing that for three years. 
wow. after I did the the takeout only thing, um, which <laughs> I, well, I guess we've maybe got to talk about. Please. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've only been drinking water. So I, I cut coffee about five or six years ago because that was really bad for me. Like I was drinking way too much in a day. I got addicted to it. Um, so I was like on 14, 15 a day. It, yeah, it's like every hour kind of thing. I was another one, another one. It just became a habit. So I was like, this is not good. So I just cut that. And so I, yeah, then a little while later I did water only. So I only had water as a drink. Um, but then I had, I took a running gel. So my thinking behind it was that I remembered that my stomach was switched off because it made sense. It's like you're amped up. So your sympathetic nervous system's going. This is my section three brain. And I was like, that depresses your, your digestive system. And so you don't have an appetite. And I was like, I don't want to make the mistake because last time when I sat it, I didn't eat on the break because I didn't feel hungry and I regretted it because then I started getting really hungry and distracted midway through. And that was when it was a three hour section two. So that was absolutely grueling. I remember regretting that. So I went, well, running gels are designed to get down and digest when your digestive system is inactive because you're running. So I'm like, that should work. So if I just take one of those, that should wake up my stomach and then bring back my appetite. And then I've got other food to eat and it worked brilliantly. So I did <laughs> that. Um, so I would recommend that for anyone who like feels like they're losing energy is because you just get immediate, like simple sugars. It wakes your stomach up and then, you, then you've got a full appetite. And then I think I ate like an apple and um, a protein bar as well. Cause I knew yeah. that like, I was really overthinking. I was like, well, if you eat protein, protein makes you feel full. So I didn't want to, like, I knew I wasn't going to eat as much as what I normally would at lunch. So yes. I was like, well, if I eat a protein bar, then I'll feel full at least for the two and a half hours and I can worry about eating when I get out again. So I did that. This Nathan. answer is much better than mine. I, I, I think Nathan <laughs> will appreciate this one. <laughs> for me, it was like, I'll pack a sandwich and some fruit. <laughs> I think I think eating well, though, I think is a real, like, I definitely would not recommend going to a cafe and, like, eating some kind of junk food. Like, I guess if you can get something, like, I would 100% say something healthy and something that is yeah. light, not heavy. Yeah. Yeah, because you don't want to feel yeah. like you're tired. You know? Don't don't try something that you haven't before either, you know. Go, go on the simple side. Yeah, you don't want to be surprised by any unexpected... <laughs> visits to the bathroom in the middle of your, your exam as well. And tell me more about, um, tell me more about your, your whole water and takeout stint as well. Yeah. So this is, this is, I have a very, uh, like obsessive personality type. I can see it and it's, it's a good yeah. thing, a bad thing. So I'm trying to use it for the right reasons now in, it was in 2018 when I was, wor I was working a lot that year. Uh, and so that was, yeah, really, really chaotic year. And I had this problem where, cause I'd worked so much. I forget to eat basically. So I get so kind of zoned in on what I'm doing that everything else just becomes not important anymore. And I'm really bad at it to the point that I was literally skipping meals while I was working, but I was working my guts out and I'm like, what are you doing? Like I would, sometimes I would realize I get to the end of the week and I'm like, I've only eaten a proper meal like twice this week. Like I might've eaten dinner once or twice in the week. And the rest of the time I was just like, eating like a cookie or something whenever I felt a bit hungry and I was not eating well because your body's just craving sugar and fat the whole time. Yeah. So then initially my thinking was, well, what if I take out the, the chore of having to cook meals and I can keep working really hard and I can just do Uber Eats? And I was like, it's expensive, but if I can keep that going, maybe then I can focus on, I was like, I moved, I moved to where I'm at now because of the fact there's a good restaurant scene. And a good cafe scene because I, I you know like eating so i was like well i won't do junk food i'll order from like a restaurant but i'll keep it in mind about how expensive it is but if i work enough i'm funding a lot of work i can use a bit of my money to pay for food so i'm eating properly and eating well sure. take out the chore of it um and so i did that and then it was literally within like about a month like i started at january 1st i was like this is great and then within about a month all of a sudden, all of the, a lot of the restaurants around me closed down. Like there's a really quick turnover that I didn't realize. Oh. Um, and so a lot of it got replaced by like burger joints and stuff like that. Like burgers are really popular in Melbourne. Um, you'll find them everywhere. So then there was a lot less choice. And so it basically turned into a lot of it was just like effectively just junk food, but just not like 
necessarily a chain junk food. It's just a small business, but they basically just make burgers or kebabs or pizza or this or that. So it very quickly turned into that. But then my mind wanted to turn it into a challenge because I realized I like challenges all the time. I was like, <laughs> what if I keep this going now that this is really tough? What if I just keep doing this and do an entire year where I don't cook and all I do is eat takeout food? And so effectively, it was like the Super Size Me documentary thing. <laughs> and I wonder if I can do that because I like testing like my stamina with things. Like, can I just put up with doing the same thing? Yeah. And not complain. So like, what if I do that with my diet and I just eat really bad food? So I went the whole of 2018 and all I did was, it was ridiculous when I look back at it. Absolutely horrible. Um, I only ate lunch and dinner. So I didn't eat breakfast. I didn't eat any snacks. Um, I just ate a really large lunch, a really large dinner, and it was pretty much always junk food. And then I wasn't drinking water that year either. So the only thing that I was drinking was soft, soft drink or milkshakes. Yeah. What? Wild. Didn't eat like the closest I got to eating like a vegetable was if there was like lettuce in a burger kind of thing. And how did your body react to this? It was surprisingly well, but I wouldn't recommend it. Like <laughs> it was rough. Like I would never do it again. I, I appreciate the experience of being able to just like do something as stupid as that. Like yeah. having the ability to do that. I was like, you know what? Just take it as an experience and just think of it as a funny story. But, I um, wish you had your camera. I know. <laughs> see, I wasn't doing it. So I didn't really document any of it. it. It messed up like my sleep pattern, for example. Like I couldn't sleep properly. And I didn't realize until a while in it. Like I was always agitated didn't was not in a good mood throughout most of the year i was always stressed wasn't able to control stress so mentally was the weird thing it had a huge mental impact because you're just not you're not eating well you're not hydrated you're not and uh because you're working so much your body's just craving fat and sugar and then you get addicted to fat and sugar and i didn't realize that i had an addiction to it because keep in mind i don't normally eat junk food so like before this i hadn't eaten any kind of takeout since i was like six years old Kind of thing. So it was a big dietary shift and I hated it. Every minute of it, I hated it. But my mind just kept going, but you can't quit because then you're giving up on something you said you would do. So I just kind of what? through like that. Um, and so I ended up becoming, the weird thing is I ended up becoming Uber Eats, like Australia, their top customer. And then it turned into a thing of like, maybe I can get something out of this. And I tried contacting them and I just didn't get a reply to it. No. So then when I looked up the, like the statistics, cause you know, they release, they kind of do like a Spotify thing where they're like, these are all our statistics on the orders and stuff. And I checked and the order number matched, like the number of orders. And I was like, that was me. And I got nothing for it. I, like, I don't even know what to say, <laughs> but it's a funny story. Like it's great. Yeah. So to yeah. me, I mean like you're, that shows you've got the stamina for medicine, <laughs> young man. Not the best story for someone who wants to become a doctor. Like, hey, I just <laughs> came through for a whole year. Yeah, I just like, I realized it didn't, wasn't until like October, November when I suddenly realized, wait a second, like I feel sick. Like I felt physically sick. Like it felt like I had food poisoning like all the time. Really? Yeah, like I just always sick in the stomach, always had a headache, um, always really lethargic, but I was still working 16 plus hour days. Yeah. <laughs> I am speechless. <laughs> so when I say like, like if I say I'm going to do something, I have a really toxic relationship with that where yeah, I, I so you're doing it, that there's no more. And I'm not like that with anything else. And I'm not like that. Like I'm a very, like with medicine, I'm talking about like, Oh, don't put pressure on yourself. It's fine. But as soon as I say, you've set this as a challenge, you're going to do it. That's like, that's it now. It's so now the water thing came immediately after that. So 2019. Yeah. When I was like, all right, I'm going to switch it. So I did a complete 180 that year. And then I wanted to see what happens if you make food good for you, but really bland the whole way. So I just did a 180 and didn't learn my lesson in that sense. So one thing was, what if I just drink water for an entire year? Just cut every single drink, only drink water. That's yeah. good for you. Use it for the right reasons. And, um, and then I also did for six months straight where all I ate was plain brown rice, plain like steamed broccoli and plain chicken breast. So there's not even enough nutrients in that. Like some things are good for you. So I was like, that's about as cardboard as food can get. So I'm like, I wonder if I can, let's see how long I can do that. So it wasn't a year. It was just like, how long can I do it? So I did that for about six months where it was, I think I, no, I ate breakfast. I ate normal breakfast, but I ate the same breakfast like muesli or something. And then lunch and dinner was the same meal 
again and with no flavor whatsoever. And I just wanted to see like, what's the functionality of food now? Like how important is it? Like how important is taste to me? Yeah. And it just turned into like an experiment. No, I just started experimenting with my diet. You're such a science guy, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, but- the arts and creative side of me is coming out and being like, but what about the joy? What about the beauty? In- yeah, I wanted to strip it all away. Like, what if it doesn't matter at all? <laughs> it comes wow. a realistic approach to it. Wow. I thought we were similar. I don't think we could be more different now. <laughs> but at the same time, I will say, like, I didn't like it. It definitely was not enjoyable. I learned 100%. Like, I never, I'm not ever doing anything. I don't, I don't mess yeah. with my diet anymore. Um, I did, oh, I did do a few more. I did do one. Yeah, I did a few more after that. You were just doing these for yourself, right? For no one else? No one else. Yeah, it was just, yeah, it wasn't to do anything with it. It was just, oh, I want to see what happens. And a lot of it was just like, I wanted to test how good my stamina is. Like, even when I hate something, can I keep doing it? That's why I started running as well. Like, yeah. running was initially because I was worried about like, you're sitting a lot and you're not doing much activity anymore. So you should probably do something that's easy to put into your life so that's why I started running and then when I realized that running is really hard and it's really something you have to just keep at really slowly I liked that side of it and I like that like you can be in pain but you have to like kind of or you can be like you know you get that fear of like oh no I can't breathe anymore like that's it but you just have to kind of control it I just turned all of my obsessiveness onto things that are good for me instead um and so that's where like the running thing and the water thing and yeah yeah i'd yeah. say that um yeah that's going to be better for you in the long term than- yeah i think it's a better thing to do so. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny though to think back about doing that but uh, oh, yeah so girls moving around if you see your name go get the brother up and just come on come on just